Welcome. I'm Art Ellis, Senior Advisor, Research Networks Unit of Elsevier. I'll be serving as the moderator of this session, which is entitled Promoting the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals at U.S. Universities, Overcoming Challenges of Academic Culture. Before introducing our three distinguished panelists, uh, what I'd like to do is provide some context for the session. In 2015, the United Nations Sustainability, Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, were adopted by member nations. There are 17 of them comprising ambitious targets for making our world more sustainable and fair by the year 2030. So we have less than a decade to act to meet these goals and progress toward many of them depends on research. A long-term struggle for American universities is demonstrating how research contributes to economic and societal impact. The SDGs provide a means to do this. Although US universities have been slow to embrace the SDGs relative to academic institutions elsewhere, they have already been contributing substantially to the SDGs and there's an opportunity to do much more by creating a more elastic academic culture. What I mean by that is that research agendas of universities are traditionally curiosity driven. Scholars pursue questions that interest and intrigue them. Progress on SDGs often results, but as a side benefit that might be overlooked. Some universities are now exper experimenting with a complementary model that involves a change in academic culture. They are introducing a society driven research agenda that more purposefully reflects the questions that society would like addressed. In other words, a campus might articulate and support an emphasis on research areas that are identified by input from regional community members and organizations. This can complement a curiosity-driven research agenda and has the advantage of more directly linking research to economic and societal impact. Let me go and uh, show my first slide. And what I have on this slide, if it's up on the screen, um, on the left-hand side are the 17 icons for the SDGs. And for example, in the first row, SDG number one, no poverty, number two, zero hunger, number three, good health and well-being. Certainly one way that a campus, as is shown in this example, can demonstrate their contributions is simply by counting articles that contribute to these SDGs. And you see that in the bar chart here with in this particular case, SDG number three, good health and well-being, having the most number of scholarly outputs, publications and other forms. You can also as a crude proxy for impact, look at how often these publications in the SDG were cited globally. And the global average for each of them is taken to be 1.0 and the orange dots show the value within the campus and within the SDG relative to that 1.0. If you wanna drill down and think about this in more depth, you can also take uh, a campus and look at a particular SDG in some detail. So here's a, a pictorial a representation of another campus and its contributions to SDG number two, zero hunger. And the way this is structured, the circumference of this circle has traditional scholarly areas. And they're color coded. So you see math and, and physics in the upper part of this in sort of purple colors. And then as you move clockwise uh, in the green area, you see engineering and agriculture, medicine in red, social sciences, business and economics in yellow. And the interior shows the clusters of articles that are obtained by keywords and queries of the uh, bibliometric databases that exist that enable you to see that, for example, the red cluster represents a lot of articles that this campus is contributing in something like uh, studies of malnutrition. And the yellow areas would be microfinance as, as an example, the green biofuels. So this gives you some idea of, of how these connections are made, even when the authors may not even be aware that they're contributing to the SDGs. Let me conclude my opening remarks by noting that whatever combination of curiosity-driven and society-driven research agendas exist on a campus, 
uh, we can use these kinds of data analytic tools to recognize SDG related research contributions. Internally, these contributions can be valorized as part of individual performance reviews, departmental performance reviews, all in the pursuit of academic excellence and, and professional service. But importantly too, externally, a campus can craft compelling narratives around its SDG contributions that directly demonstrate the economic and societal impact of its research. And our hope in this session is that it will raise awareness of the SDGs and spur further US university contributions to them. In today's session, we have three distinguished speakers who will elaborate on these SDG related themes. Our first speaker is Amanda Ellis. She's executive director, Asia Pacific Global Institute of Sustainability and Innovation at Arizona State University. Amanda has experience in the global nature of buy into the SDGs and ASU supported national and international partnerships that advance them. She'll be assisted by Jessica Gibbons, a uh, project manager. So Amanda, please. Thank you so much, Art. And I really was so taken by your reference to society inspired work. And so for me, having been ambassador to the United Nations at the time when the SDGs were being negotiated, it was wonderful for me to arrive at ASU and see that there was already such a strong tradition of youth inspired, society inspired approaches. Wanting to talk just a little bit about a brand new initiative which now houses the Global Institute of Sustainability, and that is the Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory at ASU, and you can see the brand new building here. The idea is that we can shape tomorrow today through using the SDGs as a lens, and you can see here five different spaces from the learning and discovery space solutions which universities often focus on but also networks and engagement which is my real area of focus and within that you can see 14 different focal areas from quite different disciplines all now working together using the sustainable development goal map as a rubric to work together across disciplines Elsevier and the research that it has done around the SDGs globally has been a real prompt for us at ASU. And we're thrilled to be number one in the US for impact in the Times Higher Education rankings on the Sustainable Development Goals and in the top 10 globally. It's really helped us to shape the narrative and a common language across the university. I think you mentioned the words compelling narrative art. And I think that sums up for us very much the engagement right across the university, including student led initiatives like our SDG change makers. So we have a cross university task force, which I am thrilled to co chair with the Dean and Director General of Thunderbird, Dr. Sanjeev Kagram, who also has been very involved in the United Nations in the past. And the, the role of this task force is to bring experts from right across the university, including students, uh, staff and faculty, to think about how are we engaging in the sustainable development goals in three ways. First of all, looking at stock taking, and really how we can measure what we're doing. When I ran the development agency for New Zealand, I was always onto my team to think about what was the outcome, what was the impact of the work that they were having. And now that we have this global development framework, which 193 UN member countries signed onto in 2015, which really gives us this agreed agenda from 2015 to 2030. It's so useful to have a range of indicators uh, to be able to measure against. So the stock take is something that we do across the SDGs. Second of all, looking at global partnerships for SDGs where we really take a deep dive at ASU. And I'll be telling you about some of my favorites. And finally, looking beyond 2030, how can we influence future thinking? And we roughly talk about 
regenerative development goals, knowing that sustainability is no longer enough and we need to be thinking about circular economy, carbon drawdown, both nature-based and technological, and thinking about Indigenous wisdom as well. So just to give you a couple of examples on metrics and measurements, this is SDG 6 on clean water and sanitation. And we have some real global experts in this area, including Dr. Dave White, who leads a cross university consortium, and Dr. Bruce Ritter, who won the Stockholm Water Prize. So the idea is to really create a living directory that can be used both internally and externally. And hopefully this will encourage our students too, to be using this language. We're also in the midst of developing a long, it's actually a student led project, a mini module so that every student is up to date with the SDG framework before they actually begin at ASU. So a few global highlights that I'd like to, uh, to uh, showcase, and these are around our partnerships. So a very recent one, and I'm here at COP26. So this one is top of mind at the moment. Uh, four partners, Climate Competent Boards, which is a woman-led uh, enterprise, the ASU Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory, Thunderbird and the Said Business School at Oxford. And this is really looking at how we can transform the mindset of board directors through this climate competent program, helping them to think through. This is a really fascinating one, which falls into our research area. And again, very youth inspired. So Dr. Jesse Senko uh, was working with local fisher communities in the Philippines to help reduce bycatch and it came up with a new invention of solar lamps on fishing nets instead of the usual battery powered, which often end up being tossed into the ocean. And this has really been a twofer, both looking at renewable energy, SDG 7, and then also looking to protect uh, this bycatch of species, and it has had the offshoot of sustainable production and consumption, SDG 12 as well, in that now fishers have to go less far and fish for less time and have lower bycatch as well. So it's really been a win-win-win through looking at that rubric across the SDGs. This is one that I know will be of great interest to our IT experts and librarians. Solar Spell, a solar powered educational learning library for the more than 1 billion people who don't have access to the internet. And here, this is led by Dr. Laura Hossman in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society. And this tiny solar powered library actually has specially curated materials for the island community or refugee community. And that way our librarians are very engaged in creating materials that are totally tailored for the community. And then the solar powered library allows access for a global partnership with the Peace Corps to then work with local teachers and Peace Corps volunteers so that students can all access through a, whole, a solar hotspot this material. And now our mechanical trees, SDG 13, I'm at COP, and there are now four big companies globally, and ours is one called Carbon Collect, that are working with carbon drawdown technology. And you can see here an example of a mechanical tree that Dr. Klaus Lochner is working on. I was just presenting this afternoon on sea level rise and the Pacific Islands, and it just reminds us how central climate is, SDG 13 is, to everything, given the urgency of the situation right now. We have a global partnership also with Starbucks. Every Starbucks barista uh, goes through a training program called the Greener Apron. And every Starbucks barista has the opportunity to finish for free a college degree at ASU. So there's a very strong use inspired educational component. And we are now working with Starbucks to become people and planet positive by 
2025. So there's a big research component in this now too. This is my favorite. So working with the World Bank, who have come up with a beautiful set of summaries for every country. And I would like to do a little pop quiz. How many countries in the world have yet reached full gender equality? The answer is zero. And there's only 10 that even have it under the law. So Women Business and the Law Program at the World Bank summarizes this across a woman's life cycle. And our students have used an AI tech mechanism to enable this map, and we encourage you to visit it. You can click on any country and get a summary of the laws that need to be changed to meet commitments under SDG 5, gender equality. And we are going to race through the last couple of slides in our remaining time. So this gives you an idea of the training for parliamentarians that links all of this work together. So the technical work at the World Bank, our students, and then working with the Interparliamentary Union and a range of other parliamentary groups like the Commonwealth to then bring together all of these groups for positive change. And you can see there the array of partners. And as we finish up, just leaving you with the thought of how important global partnerships are for really being able to have universities integrate the SDGs in a use inspired way. Thank you so much, Art. Thank you, Robin. Excuse me, thank you, Amanda. <laughs> Our next speaker is Robin, um, Robin Keir. Robin is liaison librarian of the University of Pittsburgh Libraries and faculty center president of the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Robin has considerable knowledge of engagement of US academic libraries and the University of Pittsburgh faculty around the SDGs. Robin, please. Uh, thank you, Art. And thank you, uh, Amanda, for sharing all those wonderful initiatives at uh, Arizona State. Um, so many great things going on. Um, and I'm here to talk a little bit about how academic libraries uh, can contribute uh, by both supporting faculty uh, and working with researchers on their campuses uh, through various ways. So the three main areas that I wanna talk about in relation to academic libraries, uh, helping you know, the research communities, but also uh, maybe others in their immediate communities, uh, providing access to research and data, uh, supporting uh, campus sustainability efforts, and also uh, working through uh, teaching and research agendas and how to make those um, rewarded, right? So many of the things that you've already seen, you know, how to make that rewarded in the promotion and tenure process. Uh, my first area, uh, access to research and data, uh, really relates to two of the SDGs, uh, SDG four, uh, ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education, uh, promoting lifelong learning and uh, for all. And also SDG 16, which is promoting peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development and providing um, access to justice um, and inclusive institutions at all level. Uh, also, this area can benefit from access to research and data for awareness and discussion for transparent reporting on government funded process, uh, projects and also a sub goal there access to research and data for training and skill development. And libraries can certainly help provide, provide that. And there are two ways that I want to talk about that libraries really support this is by uh, advancing open access on their campuses and working with uh, faculty and research researchers when they publish materials to make them aware of um, author agreements and how to make uh, first drafts even, uh, or sorry, final drafts before publication, uh, negotiating that in to author agreements to make that accessible, um, advocating for gold and green open access to um, research materials at the university, promoting the use of uh, a libraries often have institutional repositories, especially in the United States and, and um, Europe, um, 
that and um, recommending some to build one if they don't have one, right, uh, at academic libraries. So where researchers and faculties work um, in sort of different formats, but most most usually uh, through um, articles, uh, make those available in their institutional repository. So at our university, we have a scholarly communications librarian who works specifically on these issues, and there's a team that uh, works on open access and uh, sharing information about copyright. Uh, the second way that uh, libraries can, academic libraries can help support um, the SDGs specifically are uh, advancing open educational resources too. Uh, we have librarians here also that support these initiatives. Um, we have uh, provost level initiatives, funding reviews, we have an open education librarian. So, you know, this is different from open access in that you are trying to create educational materials that can be used um, by others, uh, whether that's creating an open textbook or um, with your expertise or creating um, different media as well. Uh, the second main area that I want to uh, touch on here is supporting campus sustainability efforts. Uh, libraries can really um, work with um, those offices. And of course, it sounds like, it, uh, you know, we've heard of one that uh, all these sustainable efforts are really strong. And I it, like the, um, I hope the libraries are working uh, with you too. Uh, on my campus, uh, with sustainability, supporting and becoming active in those efforts is important. We have that sustainability office, and they are great partners for this work for libraries to think about um, not only, um, as Art suggested, making the research um, visible that your university might be doing uh, in the SDG areas, uh, helping to make that visible through the library's resources, uh, but also just, um, you know, through programming, um, through the library audience, you know, the libraries serve, of course, the whole uh, university. Uh, this is different depending on every, you know, every place, what this office is and what it does. But um, there's so many things um, related to sustainability efforts on campus that libraries can help with from physical uh, from physical, uh, you know, containers in, you know, in spaces to um, working more on the research oriented activities. Uh, for me, the sustainable development goals, as Art uh, said at the beginning, relate to community engagement and uh, societal impact, um, as Art said. So our university is in an urban environment, so they are often working together with city uh, leadership and uh, of the city of Pittsburgh and uh, even neighborhoods and other universities um, to advance commitment right to efforts of the SDGs. Um, and here's an example of our uh, provost um, talking to, uh, two years ago at um, the UN General Assembly Forum. So the urban campus also provides different kinds of uh, research opportunities for community engagement that. Um, uh, can really help with local uh, SDG efforts. Uh, the third area I want to talk about here are teaching and research agendas. So this is one of the strongest ways that libraries uh, can contribute um, by integrating SDGs into work that librarians do, but also um, thinking about uh, faculty and how to make that um, beneficial. So one thing that I uh, want to talk about here are efforts to add community outreach and diversity, equity, and inclusion work into tenure and promotion requirements. And what does that look like when work like that is rewarded not only for research, uh, but also just on its own, right? Uh, community outreach as a value, um, you know, sort of in addition to uh, what research outputs there might be, or um, what the service component might be. So what does that look like? And how do we make that work uh, of, of, of elevating these two areas in tenure and promotion 
how can we re relate that to SDGs, community outreach, um, and how to make these goals something that faculty are doing because it helps them to be successful, right? It helps them to become promotable. Um, as president of our faculty senate, uh, I'm insisting in these efforts with our uh, provost office for the University of Pittsburgh uh, faculty. Um, also, librarians specifically can help with curriculum integration by um, mainstreaming education on SDGs, using these in teaching uh, research concepts. Uh, librarians are often talking to students about uh, information concepts, critical thinking, and how to do research. Uh, of course, um, supporting faculty when they're doing this for their own work. And then also, um, you know, involving students too. Uh, there's a report there that comes from a sustainable development network for universities, um, accelerating education for SDGs in universities. So uh, groups that um, I've been involved with this first group that I think libraries uh, should keep an eye on related to the SDGs, um, the American Library Association, UN SDG Task Force, we worked for a year on elevating awareness among libraries uh, nationally in the US. Um, also, um, a library group called OCLC Global Research Council focused on the SDGs for, for a year, and also that sustainable um, group that I mentioned for universities. So what, one last thing that I want to share are uh, from that um, American Library Association Task Force chart, thinking about uh, how specifically charts that can raise awareness for libraries on their campuses um, and how the research of their faculty support the sustainable development goals. So this is something that's available for others to adapt and use um, and to uh, use on their own. Okay, so thank you. Um, that's all I have for now, Art. Thank you, Robin. Um, and our final speaker is, is uh, Deborah Rowe. Deborah is president of the US Partnership for Education for Sustainable Development. She has deep knowledge of the role of professional organizations in supporting SDGs, as well as of many other stakeholder groups. Deborah, please. I am so glad to be here with you today. This is just great. Um, I look forward to the conversation and most importantly, to the actions that are going to occur. So I wanna start with um, sharing some sites for you and explain that Everything I'm going to share, you're going to see a link to uspartnership.org afterwards, but it's a simple one, uspartnership.org. Just go to the higher ed resources, and there are links there to the rest of this. So um, at the higher U.S. Partnership for Education for Sustainable Development, we've been working on how do we integrate sustainable development into all the different areas of higher education um, for 17 years. And uh, we've had wonderful partners who have really helped us to see where the gaping holes are, and we still have many gaping holes, and what we can do to fill those in quickly, because we have a very short timeline to prevent massive and unnecessary human suffering to help stabilize climate, so then we can solve these other SDGs in a in an era that we're not in the middle of crises all the time. So climate is very urgent. And of course, all the sustainable development goals are very important. So one of the things we've heard is a lot of students and a lot of community people wanna work in the field of green and sustainability, but they don't know what those jobs and career pathways are. So, um, I don't know, five years ago, uh, we had a front page article on Career Convergence Magazine, which is an academic advisors association, um, career advisors association. And what are those green and sustainability jobs and how can people get them? So a lot, we've got like 2000 new degrees now in the US around this topic. And then students get out and they look for job descriptions that say sustainability. And, then they're discouraged because there's a lot of competition and people who are more experienced than they are because they've just gotten out of school. So we let them know that there's multiple pathways on how to get a green and sustainability job. And it's important that we share this information with them. Dare I say that our career centers could do a much better job of this? 
and that lots of times students do come to the libraries to try to figure this out. So you'll see the article there, it's been updated, it's been made international as well as national, and it talks about how you can be an entrepreneur within any organization, a change agent from within. You could be an entrepreneur setting up those types of businesses that don't exist yet that we need, but you can also apply for the standard jobs. If you remember all three strategies, it's a lot easier to build a career pathway successfully. So that's one resource for you. The second is we need a workforce that's really going to help us scale up um, in this very urgent time, the solutions to climate and the solutions to the other SDGs. So UNEP, in collaboration with the U.S. Partnership, we put together a global guidance document. You can click on it right here. This tells our strategy of how we're working, reaching out to ministers of education, working with youth organizations, how we've already worked with multiple U.N. agencies, with the World Bank, with the International Renewable Energy Association. There's all sorts of resources there on that page. And um, this is the global guidance document on education for green jobs. And this is like a one-stop shop. It took us close to a year to put together all the resources that we could find on what universities need to be doing and maybe aren't doing as well as they could to uh, scale up the green and inclusive and sustainable workforce that we need. And you can see we have reviewers from fantastic organizations and then all sorts of interesting information. So one-stop shop here. And you can get that global guidance document once again on that uh, UNEP page that I just talked about. Also, academics. Well, there's a disciplinary associations network for sustainability known as DANS that we set up 17 years ago. It's housed at AISHI, the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Ed. But you can also find it on the U.S. Partnership website. And um, just to give you a sense of what's there, uh, here's all of the associations that have been members. It's an informal network, any academic society can join. So as you can see, there's about 45 associations that covers, you know, from math and marketing, political science, psychology, I can't even name them all, but all of them looking at how to integrate sustainability into what they teach and um, also into their research. And there's a great page of resources there as well. Um, so if you go uh, and click on the resources page, then you'll see if you click on any of these discipline areas, there's a bunch of resources. And then there's also like, so here's agriculture and it takes you to an overall collection. There's a section for interdisciplinary. So that's all free and available for you um, at Disciplinary Associations Network for Sustainability, also known as DANS. Um, the next thing I want to share with you is the Sustainable Development Goals Publishers Compact. Now, this came from a collaboration with the UN. It's actually the head of publishing offices and the International Publishers Association. And I know that some of the people on this call today have been quite involved with it as a publisher as well. Um, there are many publishers from around the world that have already joined on. And very delighted to see this kind of activity. So your library can get involved with this as well. It explains the Publishers Compact, what people commit to, and we are enhancing this with all sorts of additional information over this next year. So um, we also started a fellows program. We made a presentation about this and we ended up with about 16 people, many of them from publishers. Um, some of them, we actually have a couple of librarians out of Cornell University um, and we're doing a bunch of different projects. You might, one of you listening to this might wanna become an SDG um, Publishers Compact Fellow. You can reach out to me if you're interested. Um, it takes about three hours a week where you're doing a pro bono volunteering unless you can fit it into your job. And we're asking, you know, you got to commit at least three months so we get something done <laughs> in order to be one of these fellows. But uh, we've got a whole section on library collections and how do we tag articles and how do we um, 
set it up in the library so that when people come in, they're so exposed to the SDGs and they see where the collections are. They're also doing some great work on how do we reframe um, how we organize things and amongst the research articles and you know, even the textbooks. So that it's easier for people to find these things. So a lot of good work going on there. We also have fellows who are working on journal rankings. Loved that idea about changing tenure and promotion requirements. Um, and so we've got a whole section in another group called HESI, the Higher Ed Sustainability Initiative. This group is uh, made up of multiple United Nations agencies and you, and excuse me, you know, multiple UN agencies and higher ed networks for sustainability from all around the world. And we've been coming together for a few years now and identifying high impact initiatives. And one of them is changing the rankings and the assessments and the ratings and updating them. So um, we are working on that as fellows at the SDG Publishers Compact as well. We're actually a work group that's uh, coming out of HESI, the Higher Ed Sustainability Initiative. And um, as those journals rankings change, we will be giving more credit to research that is aligned with making a positive impact on the world, aligned with the SDGs. We're also actually looking at changing impact factor itself. Would love to have your input in on that. And we hope that you will share out the new measurements and types of impact factors that we are um, going to be putting out. You'll see it here on the SDG Publishers Compact page. We created a top 10 for reviewers and editors so that when they actually are putting a new article into a journal, it's appropriately tagged. And it says, here's how we relate to the SDGs and that the reviewers should be asking those questions if the author hasn't already put it into their article. So we have that top 10 list. Uh, we're also uplifting in general and in multiple ways, applied research and applied teaching that is related to the SDGs. <clears throat> and making an explicit connection um, between researchers and practitioners. And interesting, a lot, interestingly, a lot of the publishers who do academic journals also have uh, trade publications. Um, and research will be better if we understand where the practitioners who are actually helping to solve the SDGs feel like they need research, particularly in under-resourced countries, um, because then the researchers can pick topics for their journals, for their specific articles, for their stream of research that will be more helpful at this important time where we have so many societal issues to address and that can be addressed to build a better future. Um, so I also help mentor an international youth-led campaign on climate action. And many of the youth express that they just don't sleep that well at night because they are so worried about the climate crisis and they don't see the adults changing enough. They don't see them acting like it's a crisis and they're not meeting the targets that we need in our last few years opportunity to stabilize climate and prevent this massive, I mean, really massive human suffering, the latest Princeton study showing that it looks like 3 billion people aren't gonna be able to be outside where they live because of the climate and what the human body needs to be able to be in an environment and it won't be safe for them. So we've really gotta act like it's a crisis and take action appropriately. And of course, where do you go when you need new information? The libraries will be so key. Um, Students also want to have applied projects and applied research. So Epic N is a model that's being used around the world now by universities to better connect with their communities and help solve those community problems. And we also have, and you'll see this, all of this at uspartnership.org, beyond doom and gloom, because we don't want to doom and gloom the community and the students. We want to engage them in climate solutions and that, and SDG solutions, that means policy. So please make visible, easy to find 
how students and community members um, can be involved with systemic shift through policy changes. And I loved the earlier speakers um, initiative talking about that. And then finally, uh, we brought together 30 academic disciplinary societies from STEM and put together sustainability improved student learning and this website known as Sizzle um, shows some of the research that if you teach about sustainability while you're teaching your academic discipline, um, that you also will get more learning. Um, and it talks about the quality components of a good assignment, which is promote understanding without doom and gloom, focus on solutions, and empower students to make positive changes. Let them practice being effective change agents while they're in school so that they can move from just armchair pontification to effective systemic action. So those are some of the resources I have. Glad to be part of the question and answer now. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Deborah. And thanks to all of our speakers, um, Amanda, Jessica, Robin, and, and um, Deborah. We really appreciate uh, the great presentations that you've given. We have a little bit of time for, for questions. Um, I'd like to pose one and invite um, our panel to respond. In what ways could society provide input to reshape the academic culture to facilitate awareness and contributions uh, of the SDGs? Any thoughts that any of you have about ways that society could provide more input that would be helpful in the university or academic environment? Amanda? May I just jump in there? Yes. So I think a couple of interesting examples. First of all, the city of Phoenix has been working very closely with the university. And so it's been looking at very practical programs. We have a sustainable cities network across Arizona as well. So looking at how that can help solve some of the very practical problems we're seeing. Similarly, all of you know about the Colorado River and uh, the impending shortages. And so water and very practical in a very practical way. And then, of course, taking those from our play space to some of the other centers in which we work, like Hawaii, where we partner very deeply with Hawaii Green Growth and the local 2030 Island Hub, looking at some of those issues. And then, of course, going global with the Global Carbon Removal Partnership, which is really looking at how can we come together around nature-based solutions and technological solutions to really move the dial on SDG 13. And that's a, a global partnership with the government of Kenya and the government of Colombia and a whole range of other university stakeholders. Thank you. Um, uh, Art, oh, so you were muted, did you say something? Uh, yes, thank you, Amanda, and Robin and, and Deborah, your thoughts. Oh, sure. No, I think that one way to, to find out how society can influence this is to ask, ask them, right? So it's kind of um, going uh, out and for universities to have meaningful uh, interaction with their communities uh, and ask them what they need, right? What, what um, you know, and universities do try to do that, you know, um, as Deborah said, through, through workforce uh, prediction. But um, I think that at the University of Pittsburgh, we've created uh, two, um, hopefully maybe three, uh, community engagement centers. So it's a place that is always there. And it does sometimes tie to research in the community, but it's also a place for the community to tell the university what they need. right? right. And, and those people that are in those community engagement centers can then connect them to researchers who might be interested, you know, in pursuing what that community needs, right? So it's a two way, right? It's not just, you know, researchers going out and finding out uh, with a question in mind, right? It's it, instead of turning that process around and saying, well, what do, you know, what do you need and how can research, especially research related to sustainable development goals help with that? Thank you, Robin. Deborah. Yeah, so um, one of the things I did in the past is I helped to run the Detroit Green Skills Alliance. And so our job was to grow the green economy in Detroit. And so you start with a listening tour, right? 
And so we convened the companies that were trying to grow the green economy, the, the government groups, the nonprofits, and we said to them, um, what are you struggling with? And they said, you know, we need better policy, we need better workforce development, we need, there were a couple of other things. And we said, okay, um, and why are you struggling with it? Well, because we don't have time to do that when we're doing this too. And then we put together work groups that were across those groups. And higher ed was the, con helped to be the convener and the facilitator of that. Mm -hmm. And so we've also, we've got a toolkit. We've got something called The Seed Center. Look up theseedcenter.org. This is a site that um, we put together for all the community colleges in the country, but we have found that it's very useful to universities as well. It's got over 900 vetted resources on innovative partnerships as well as skills and competencies and career pathways in areas like solar and wind and green building and energy efficiency and sustainable ag and sustainable ed sustainability education in general. But there's also a toolkit on there, a couple of them. One is on how employers and higher ed can connect. We don't do a great job of that. You know, if you're an Accenture or you're an Apple, yeah, you know how to get on campus and do those um, interviews and get the students. But if you're some company that's growing as fast as it can to meet the wind or solar or energy efficiency needs of this country so that we stop destroying the, the planet, you don't have time to figure out how universities work with getting the students and the job placements. So we need to be helpful with that. Anyway, at the seedcenter.org under toolkits, under resources, you'll see that bite size helping employers. We also did a webinar with the World Bank on this on an international level. It's not just a U.S. problem. So there's, there's that. I think going back to that epic N where your assignments that the students have, the teaching as well as the research should be around what the community needs are. I agree with Robin, it cannot be just the question that you have because you're in your N plus one level of your research stream. Your research stream should be defined by the needs of the world, not what you find kind of interesting or compelling. So um, list, doing those listening tours first, First, and also there's a toolkit at the seedcenter.org on how higher education can be a convener um, so that you can create a climate action plan. Don't just make a plan, also do an implementation and then a, a formative and ongoing evaluation for continuous improvement. Um, I've gone to a lot of colleges and universities and done the staff development um, for faculty and staff but I always say to them, don't just bring me in to do that for uh, how do you integrate sustainable development. I want the Chamber of Commerce there. I want the mayor's office there. I want the United Way. I want the environmental groups there. I want the justice groups there. I want the DEI groups there, so, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, so that whatever we do, we're doing it in the context of real world applications. And by the time we're done, the assignments that the faculty and the staff, curricular and co-curricular, are really geared towards what the community needs. And don't go just local. So if you go to projectsthatmatter.org, we actually have a matchmaking website where people can post projects that they want to work on or that they need help with. And then students and faculty and others, pro bono volunteers, can find projects that they want to contribute to. So take a look at that model. You could create your own or just use that platform. We made it so it's free to everybody, projectsthatmatter.org. Thank you, Deborah. And one other suggestion that I, I know some of the uh, universities have begun to employ is that uh, they will occasionally, for example, for promotion and tenure cases, uh, have somebody from society who is knowledgeable about a project that the individual is working on be part of that discussion and deliberation. I have one other question for, for the uh, panel. Um, both, I think, uh, Amanda, you mentioned the Times Higher Education ranking of impact. Um, this is something that's relatively new. And I'd be curious uh, on each of the panelists' perspectives on how does that influence campus thinking in your view? That's such a great question. And I think in our case, I think it's influenced a lot. So it really galvanized the cross working group uh, with the provost's office to look at 
the various dimensions of the rankings, in some cases to question them mm -hmm. and to provide feedback. So it, it heightened the level of engagement across the whole university and brought together all the different stakeholders. Uh, and of course, when you heighten engagement, then people get more interested. And because it's an annual thing, then we found some professors were beginning to tag their courses with SDGs and others, uh, well, we're not quite as advanced as, as we might be on the research side, but doing that also with research. So um, yeah, I think it's been a very, very positive impetus. Thank you, Amanda. Robin, Deborah, your thoughts, if you have. Um, yeah, no, I'll, I find that administrators um, pay very close attention to any kind of rankings um, and the inputs into those rankings. And um, sometimes the, that is done in invisible ways, right? Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, universities try to influence rankings um, in ways that you don't see. But then in this case, I think that uh, uh, a ranking that includes um, success in sustainable areas uh, would, um, I think, be something that is promoted through sort of a sustainability office like we have or other areas or through the provost office as something that is important, um, not just for, for the ranking, but for, uh, you know, society at large, as, as we've been discussing and, and, you know, improving the world's problems, right? And if the ranking uh, helps to get universities there, then great. I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> if that helps, uh, every little bit helps with this. So, um, and I think that uh, being able to say that, as, as Amanda has said, you know, they're number one in the U.S., that's, that's quite an accomplishment, you know, and I'm sure other universities would like to say the same thing, uh, number one in that, in that impact, that part of the ranking. So um, I think they're influential. Thank you, Robin. Deborah, any thoughts you'd like to add? So we have a work group called Ranking Assessments and Ratings at the Higher Ed Sustainability Initiative, and Duncan... Ross from Times Higher Ed is on that group. I was in a meeting with him this morning. And um, I, I'm pleased to see the direction that that's going. Um, I think we've got some other rankings that really need to be changed. I think that FT50 is a real problem. I remember when I got out with my PhD in business and I looked at what were considered the top ranked journals. And I'm like, this isn't where I want to publish. I've already, you know, owned a solar company. I've already been working on climate all this time. And you're telling me I've got to go into those journals to go to the top schools. But those journals aren't relevant to these very urgent issues. And it is time for changes in some of those rankings. And we all can work together to push on that. What do you highlight? Some of them, you get ranked higher if you're a bad article. And so there's been lots of citations of your article because it's bad. I mean, this is just not even logical. Right. And it also skews the, the incentives. So we need leadership to be pushing for that change within universities. We need librarians. You're, you're in a key place, right, to help make that happen as well. Um, faculty. Um, students, of course, can always be pushing, and they do, but we need to listen to them. Uh, let's get these rankings online um, with what we need to do and what we can do. That's what's so exciting about the human species is, look, sometimes we act like toddlers or adolescents. I mean, we're clearly a young species, and we're acting in you know short-term thinking, immature ways, but you wouldn't give up on your toddler, would you? Did you see me hesitate about the word <laughs> teenager? I know there are moments those teenagers can really push you and make you stay up all night worrying, but you still don't give up on them. Right. We need to not give up on this species, but we also need to call it out for when the rankings that are there and the incentive structures that are there are not logical. Like, why is it that in economics, that, that things are still considered externalities when those externalities affect us so much. So we need to change our theories. We need to change the dominant patterns of thinking, our standards for the major. And the good news is there are great universities around the world that already have successful precedents. Anything you're trying to do in a higher ed institution for sustainability, chances are somebody's already doing it. And I love being involved internationally because we get to hear those stories and you can be too, if you're not already. 
So um, if also, if you haven't looked at ACI and STARS, the Sustainability Tracking and Rating System, uh, that's, that's a more comprehensive kind of rating system than what we're, uh, you should take a look at it. There's a lot you can learn from the credits there. And you can also, it's, a, it's in the process of continuous improvement. So you can help all of us get better by your ongoing engagement. Thanks. Great. Thank, thanks very much. Let me, uh, we're winding toward the end of our time, but I do want to put up um, a couple of additional slides. Uh, one has to do with um, resources. Um, and in particular, let's see, can folks see this? I'm trying to advance this because I had some. Oh, it's staying on that first one of UN SDGs and the campus map. Yeah, let me. There we go. Can you see re resources now? Mm, share it again. Yeah, sharing. Uh, I know I want the other two speaker slides. <laughs> there we go. Let's share this. There we go. Okay, so uh, you, you've heard from our panelists uh, a number of uh, websites already, and uh, these are some others that uh, had previously been contributed. So we certainly invite you to take a look at these to get more information about the SDGs. And also um, the- Can you make that a little bigger, Art? Can yeah. you- uh, Yeah, yeah, let's see. Does it, you know, that size thing on the bottom? There we go. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, uh, so these these again provide some additional information on the SDGs, and then uh, if you for viewers uh, attendees, if you have comments, uh, if you'd like additional information, please feel free to contact me uh, at this email address. Be happy to consult with the panelists as as needed, uh, and to get you whatever information uh, that you seek. So let me conclude by again thanking Amanda, uh, Jessica, Robin, and Deborah for their uh, excellent contributions. Uh, also, we're grateful to Gwen Evans, the Vice President, uh, Global uh, Library Relations at Elsevier, and Zoe Genova, Communications and Engagement Manager at Elsevier, for their technical support for today's panel. And finally, we thank you, uh, the attendees, for your interest and look forward to hearing from you. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Thank everybody. Thank you, Art.